So this mycogon stuff, it's got a ton of ridiculously studied herbs in here that if you just sit down in front of PubMed.com, it's free. Um, there's PubMed and there's the Cochrane database, for those of you who are not familiar. Those are the two research settings. So I spend a lot of my life sitting in, in front of the computer on that site. So I looked all these up and I said, how smart is Jamie? And I said, really smart. <laughs> the synergism of these nutrients, of these herbs are just out of this world. So I spend a lot of time discussing with my, my clients the need for synergism, how we balance all these nutrients and the herbs in particular. They're so powerful and they're so untapped. Um, so when, it's, when we're talking about autoimmune, the person's going to either have obvious or current uh, infections or they'll have symptoms of infections but no one can find it or they have a history of it and the lab shows it, doesn't show it. You just put them on this stuff at the dose starting on the bottle and then um, it helps to modify the immune response and uh, act as another working immune system in a sense. These herbs float around in the blood, in the plasma, they get into tissues, and they have direct anti-infective anti effects, and they support various organs and tissues and cells to work normally so that this person can manage, the immune system in particular, so this person can manage their way through an infection and or prevention. So they're anti-inflammatory, they're anti-infectious, and there are many, many other effects of, of these particular herbs as well. So as I mentioned here, they're adaptogenic, anti-infectious, also they promote cell-to-cell -cell communication. That's very important in cancer. Persons with autoimmune disease have a much higher risk of cancer and a greater history of cancer as well. And they're tissue uh, reparative. So this was a study here in patients with lupus, but again, think of this like any other autoimmune disease. Uh, the, the studies evidence that omega-3 supplementation reduced inflammation, disease activity, endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress with vitamin D supplementation. Um, it reduced inflammation even more and a lot of inflammatory markers, also clotting factors. And then turmeric supplementation, this is not commonly known, reduces proteinuria, which is protein in the urine, which all these people have. And here's what half of them say, my doctor can't find out why they don't know why I have it. Your kidneys are getting destroyed. And they say, no, no, my kidney tests are fine. Well, the kidney test is fine because you have to lose 40% of your kidney function before it shows anything. So it just comes on. And people in their 50s, 60s, 65, they, they all have chronic renal failure. And then the doctor says, oh, no, but that's normal. We expect that. 40%. 40%. Most of the lab uh, ranges are designed most to reveal abnormalities only once you've lost about 40% of homeostatic capacity. So the, my functional ranges in the blood detective program are 25% because my daddy taught me and my mommy that, why, if you can prevent something, why don't you do that? So I want to know it sooner. So we can fix proteinuria with turmeric, but not just turmeric. Turmeric with piperine or biopterine, which is the, the registered term for the piperine which is the active ingredient in a black pepper fruit. I think I got that right. Yes, I did. Okay. So turmeric is a very complex molecule. Uh, it's a polyphenolic molecule, which means it's got a bunch of phenol groups, right? They look like stop signs, all connected. It's crazy. And when you eat this stuff, 95% of it is absorbed. But less than 5% is actually bioavailable to the tissues. You're getting almost nothing. So if you combine it with piperine, and when I heard these statistics, I said, liar, liar, no way. And I looked them up, it's true. You can increase the bioavailability of, of curcumin uh, by 2,000%. That's what the study says, by combining it with black pepper fruit, which of course is what uh, Nutritional Frontiers has done. So I popped that stuff like crazy. Because several years ago, there was a study on, like in the cancer journals, that 12,000 milligrams was the, the anti-cancer dose. Remember that one of curcumin? Except this 12,000, almost none of it was being used. So maybe it was a, maybe it was a thousand or so. That was really the, the functional level that we're getting, which you can easily reach now with this combination. Synergism, folks, right? The reason I brought this study up, and let me just complete it, hematuria, which is blood in the urine and systolic blood pressure, um, along with a low glycemic diet cause weight loss, reduce fatigue, the combination of omega-3s, vitamin D, and turmeric modifies so many fundamental aspects of autoimmune degeneration, it's crazy. 
And it's changing biomarkers that, once improved, predict the person will live better and longer by, by offsetting the onset of disease or delaying it or reversing it. I'm all about reversing aging. Questions, comments, good? Okay, good. So uh, Turmeric Plus, this is worth some mention. So most of the benefits can be attributed to its antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. And Jessica Kuhn by itself, as I mentioned, does not uh, give you the major health benefits uh, due to its poor bioavailability and other, for other factors. And uh, to increase that bioavailability, we want the piperine, which is that active component that we mentioned. And uh, so I had some patients coming in, and they're on you know, forms of that uh, from who knows where they got it. They're just not correct. So not only do you want to introduce them to your, a better product, but I suggest you private label all of your products. Because, um, and I private label everything, just, just about everything. One, one thing I don't private label uh, of the, you know, stuff that, all the stuff that I do. Because it helps create you as the expert. You're private labeling things that you have researched, and then they need to come to you for them. So, and you want them to because you want them to have the best stuff if you believe that it is the best. So you can speak to Nutritional Frontiers people regarding their, um, their private labeling um, services. And I tried to do this with other products in the past and did with a lot of difficulty. Um, it's so simple, these guys just have it down. You're just done. You have beautiful labels like that and you're, you're, you have your own line. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. And um, we also know that other contributing factors in autoimmunity include infection, microtrauma, easy, you know, easy, uh, uh, or increased susceptibility to getting injured, and of course recovery, uh, more allergies and sensitivities. The Microgon product is fantastic for that. We want to get them on buffered C capsules and do a buffered C tolerance test. Um, will you figure out uh, how much vitamin C they need? Number one, vitamin C is an antihistamine, so it's important. You need vitamin C as a fundamental element for um, soft tissue and collagen repair. It uh, increases interferon in the body, which is generally low in people with autoimmunity and cancers. It's an antioxidant. It's a detoxifier. It's buffered. So generally speaking, persons with autoimmune issues, they're eating their own stuff up. They're breaking down their own proteins. Proteins add the acidic products to the blood. The blood's pH drops, and then that just, it, they're, fr they're fried over and over every day. So buffered vitamin C. I check urine vitamin C levels because the blood could sh show that they're normal. The blood could show that they're high. But if it's not coming out in the urine, they're not saturated. They may be 98% saturated, you get it? It's like one of those Buzz Bunny cartoons, where you're pouring the drink in the water, go blah, 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 blah. you want it in the urine. So I look in the urine for vitamin C, and I also measure in the urine dehydroascorbic acid, which is the oxidized form of C, which we don't want in autoimmune disease. Okay, we do want in cancer, but we don't want in autoimmune disease, strangely enough. And that, questions, input? Okay. People here are using the buffered C capsules, I hope. Most of your patients don't understand the difference between ascorbic acid and buffered C. Yes, and that'll get you. Buffered C and wait for that buffered C plus anytime you got it ready. <laughs> okay. What's the, the plus? They add the bioflavonoids back into it. Okay. Um, which we like kind of as a more whole food product. Right, right. And speaking of that, um, all of my patients with autoimmunity, I, I put them on all four of those powdered products, which I private labeled. I call them detox one, two, three, and four. Everyone gets on them, everyone. Um, except maybe the green one if they're on Coumadin. So that would be about the only contraindication that I can think of. Um, why? Because those are superfoods and they get the equivalent nutrition. And I mean, when I think about those, I really get excited <laughs> because plants have tens of thousands of healthful elements, we don't even know what half of them are, that are needed for practically every reparative process you can think of. So I start them there, and I know even on my worst day, day one, those, they get on those, I'm like, okay, good. Now, now I can work on them, think about this other stuff, but that they're getting. Sometimes I'll start them with a half a scoop of each, all mixed together at once, and water to taste, and then when they say to me, Dr. Weld, it's too sweet, I say, dilute it. They're like, oh, <laughs> you know, right, the too sweet thing. I didn't take it. All right, <laughs> I'm like, listen, life is hard. Life is very hard, and we don't just quit when things get hard. <laughs> 
No, I'm very respectful of my patients. I'm just trying to keep you awake. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, um, I wouldn't use vitamin C as your only metal chelator. It's part of the process, no doubt. Um, for example, by raising the pH of the blood, that allows for metals to dis disassociate from proteins in the blood so they can be lost in the urine better. So the dose is the tolerance dose of the patient. So like the enzyme acid product, uh, bi biozyme, uh, not biozyme, um, betazyme, th thank you. Um, I have them take one capsule per meal, three times a day, and then the next day, as long as I don't have, again, the long list of symptoms I have on my thing, uh, I have them increase to the point where they get to, you know, this stage where they're like, I, I can't take another C capsule, or, you know, I have loose stool. That's what you want. So that's called a C flush. So I tell my patients, listen, you need to be home for about five hours. You're going to be taking higher doses of this if I want to do it all at once. So let's back up from what, what we just said. Here's how you do a vitamin C flush. You say to him, okay, here's your buffered tea caps. You go home near a toilet. Take, um, depending on the, their weight and also their, their, uh, their state of health, I mean, if they're really weak and fragile, I'm not gonna blast them, you know, their colon out, you know, unless I don't like them, which I did do once, but we'll not get into that. <laughs> uh, so we never saw the guy again. He says, I don't believe in what you do. I'm like, just let me do one thing. I won't even charge you for this thing. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I have people take uh, four to six, if they're a little on the overweight side, four to six capsules of buffered C every 30 minutes until they have diarrhea. Then they're instructed, it's all written down on paper to stop, and then to write down how many capsules it took for them to get the diarrhea. Then the amount of vitamin C they need daily for any purpose is the tolerant dose. And then after a day, a week, a month, they start to get loose stool again. That means their body doesn't need as much vitamin C, so they just pull off. So now they know how to manage their C, their enzymes, and a whole bunch of other things throughout their whole lives and with your products that you've private labeled. <laughs> okay. Um, question, Doc, yes. I was wondering, uh, wouldn't it be better to go with a powder C if you're taking those huge amounts? That's another option. Yeah, I, I have both options. Um, so, yeah, either one. But they both work. They both work. Okay, just make sure that they, you have to say to them, don't go out and buy some cheaper thing that's ascorbic acid. You'll blow a hole in your gut, you know, literally in an ulcer, okay? However, if they have low stomach acid, then maybe you want ascorbic acid, okay? Okay, and then there's uh, uh, NRDMG, which is a methyl donor. Um, dimethylglycine uh, contains, obviously, glycine, which helps detoxification, helps collagen rebuilding has a choline relationship too, that helps the nervous system work better. The nervous system, it's not just the immune system that's, that's trashed here in autoimmune disease, it's all the systems really. And the nervous system is directing other systems, so we need to protect it. So I use all the powders, not just uh, you know, the orange, which is, uh, you know, t tends to be the one promoted more for, for nervous system and brain. I, I just use them all. I love them too. And I use them as a sports enhancement as well. I'll sit these um, all day, and then when I'm working out, I'll drink it during my workout. If I'm running with my camelback on, it's, I'm sucking on that. And then I make sure I finish it within 60 minutes post-workout so that my glycogen storage is replenished much better. My next workout, my recovery is much faster. And um, it's fun, nice and fun. Uh, D3, my goodness, so what can I say about D3? Uh, one of the most important nutrients. Every cell in the body has receptors for D3, including the nervous system, including the immune system. Uh, D helps immune cells uh, reproduce themselves. Um, the vitamin D blood range of 30 to 100. Doctors will stop at 50 if they're super smart, but they're, there's, there's better than super smart. There's 70, which is the, the uh, optimal dose based on meta-analysis, which actually says the higher normal the D, the better. But time after time after time, doctors are telling my patients who I've sent for D, let's say elsewhere, uh, that, um, yeah, it's 70, it's too much, you need to stop. Like, well, what, what books are you reading? I really don't understand it. So of course I have the articles you know, there for the patients, so that's what we want. You know you're giving so much, someone too much vitamin D when what few things happen. Does anyone have any idea? Yes. Too 
too much. Yes. Okay. Yes. Should I tell you what that is? Okay. <laughs> yeah, too much D3. You know, one of the best books I ever read was called Reverse Effects by Hibby, H-E-I-B-Y. Good luck trying to find this book. He is, it is the most reference medical uh, nutrition book ever written. It's this fat. And it talks about vitamin D at one level does this, but at another level does this. This guy was a librarian, and he wrote these amazing books in like nine different areas of life, and no one can find them. But uh, anyway, vitamin D, too much vitamin D will cause hypervitamin Dosis and hypercalcemia, which will harden arteries, which will deposit calcium in all the wrong places. Is that a song? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? The levels are. Yeah. Okay. So a couple, why, why, make it quick, why, please. Why not go smaller, reevaluate rather than bigger? The, um, the reason for that is because studies show that a 50,000 dose uh, in a depleted person much more quickly and reliably gets the person in the range than taking smaller amounts over a longer period of time. But most of your patients may not actually be low, they may be in the low end but they'll do just fine on the D here. Um, but sometimes I will use D3, 50,000 for that purpose. If a person is of normal weight, you give them 50,000 once a week for eight weeks, and if they're overweight, you give them 100,000, then you check the levels in eight weeks. Many doctors say, oh, the level's low, take some D. That's the first thing they say. Then, then the smarter one will say, take 1,000, or maybe two, right, or, or 10. And then very few do it correctly. And it's malpractice not to recommend 50,000, that's the other thing, if in a clinically low, uh, a person. So we were saying before, how do you know if someone takes too much vitamin D? Maybe they have symptoms like palpitations. It's absolutely possible. Um, what about lab findings? Uh, quickly, does anyone know how that might show up? Liver? The liver, yes. The liver enzymes, one or more, may be elevated because the liver stores the vitamin D, so it's hepatitis uh, happens, which is a nutrient-induced hepatitis. And what's the other one? Um, hypercalcemia. So you'll have high calcium. The vitamin D level may be high, but that doesn't actually mean it's too much, except most doctors don't know that, so they freak when they see that. The calcium is fine, the liver enzymes are fine. I don't even pay attention to it, although I, I really don't see that. I, I don't really see people having high you know, vitamin D. So again, we're talking about fundamental nutrition for all autoimmune disease. Um, let me just jump to certain things. I want to continue to emphasize that Turmeric Plus product. Uh, the omega-3 D2 as well, just watch your total vitamin D when you're giving D in a couple of different sources. Uh, the Immunomax we're going to talk about very soon, the biotics product of uh, probiotics. Probiotics are not just for leaky gut. They, first of all, they lower cholesterol. They help modify the immune system, reduce inflammation. Um, and by doing that, they, have, they, they, they modify cell-to-cell -cell communication and produce certain molecules which have distant effects on the immune system, and they're all good. And then also DHEA, DHEA. So this is the first time we're talking about hormones in any practical way. Uh, DHEA is not um, allowed. It's illegal for lots of professional sports, as you know. Uh, it's a... Um, an anabolic a steroid, and when you take this along with pregnenolone, which is another anabolic, I remember Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire years back when they hit those 50-something home runs, they were both on this stuff. Uh, but when the body's degenerating, you want it to regenerate. So that's just a simple reason why you'd want to consider DHEA and pregnenolone uh, for all of, all of your autoimmune patients, except maybe women with autoimmune disease that have any history of breast cancer because DHEA can increase the beta estradiol levels. Okay, so that would be one consideration. Um, pregnenolone can theoretically do that too, but it's higher up and diluted more. So there's cholesterol that forms pregnenolone, um, which forms progesterone, which forms testosterone. The testosterone forms a DHEA, and the testosterone forms all three estrogens, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. So if you want to play it kind of safer, you might want to give pregnenolone, which is higher up, it gets diluted down the branches, you know, as opposed to if you really want to whack DHEA, you give DHEA. I like using both, and I take both. And uh, the X-Flame, this is uh, very interesting. Um, this uh, Cresilazine uh, registered form formula, 
is a highly buffered creatine monohydrate. So creatine monohydrate is very popular in the um, sports areas, and it works. I mean, it's, it's, um, it has anabolic effects, and it also has uh, anti-catabolic effects. So it slows down breakdown of lean body tissue. Remember, lean body tissue assessment is the single most accurate biomarker of morbidity and mortality. So everything that you use that helps maintain lean body mass is like really important. DHEA does that, pregnenolone does that, whey protein does that, and this particular product too, creatinine monohydrate, which they've used the, a process that they're not telling me about, uh, it's proprietary, that uh, is creating this under a highly buffered process rather than an acidic process, which uh, doesn't give you a, a superior product. So it also has in that the DMG, turmeric, boswellia, which is frankincense, a very, very important uh, phytonutrient for inflammation and immune modulation and cancer. And it's been studied in every autoimmune condition we're talking about today, reducing inflammation, reducing joint inflammation, body inflammation. I, you know, you can go on all day long about these phytonutrients uh, uh, with, with quercetin and ginger root, cayenne pepper. It's, it's, it's really an impressive uh, formulation. In terms of the DHEA, uh, I start people out on about 25 milligrams and, um, in the morning because DHEA levels are generally higher in the morning. And then I just make sure after a week or two then they're, they're dealing well with that dose. Sometimes people will complain of uh, hair growing in all the weird places and, and uh, acne, which might mean that uh, the DHEA is producing too much testosterone for them. If so, then I put them on the prostate product, even if they're women, to block the uh, dihydrotestosterone, which you can do with salt palmetto. Okay? So salt palmetto blocks a dihydrotestosterone. It also blocks testosterone. Yes, doctor? Higher in the morning. Pardon? Higher in the morning. Higher in the morning. Why would you want them to take the supplement in the morning? Because you're just wanting to mimic the normal circadian uh, production of that hormone. Just like melatonin is higher at night, you take melatonin at night. You don't take little bits of melatonin during the day and work your way up at night unless you want to die because that increases risk of uh, various cancers, particularly breast cancer in women. So you take the melatonin before bed and you take the DHA in the morning because DHA should be high in the morning, but it's not, Doc. This is the point, because in autoimmune disease, it's either low or it's not high enough. Remember, you don't have to just get people's levels in normal ranges. That just means they're average. And who wants to be average? These people are not average. So if I measure their DHA and it's you know, twice the, 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 the range, I don't care. I, I, that's why I don't do saliva, you know, DHEA cortisol ratios. It's a waste of money, and it doesn't change what I do. So if they have side effects from DHEA, then I'll back off. M almost no one does. You start off with this, and I will sometimes end up giving them as much as 200 milligrams a day, even more, but 200 milligrams is a very, very clinically important range for most autoimmune diseases, particularly lupus, but many others. Doctor, do you have a question? Um, thyroid medication and DHA, there's no reason to. It's certainly not on the list, so no. Um, good question just to remind us that there may be reasons to not take certain nutrients with certain medications. You know. Technically, DHA is medication. It is a prescription as well. But uh, adrenal function and thyroid function are inextricably tied, so they're synergistic. Will that increase their estrogen levels? Yeah, as I just mentioned, it's possible. So it's possible. So if someone has a history of either breast cancer, which I mentioned, or I didn't mention before, prostate cancer, I probably wouldn't give the DHEA. I'll use the herbal adrenal supports and other types of supports, like vitamin C, to help promote natural uh, DHEA. Um, oh, the reason I mentioned, and then I'll get to you, the reason I mentioned I might not give DHEA to someone with a history of prostate cancer, because prostate cancer is basically breast cancer in a man. And breast cancer in a woman is basically, you know, it's the same. The same hormonal problems, basically the same treatments, and the same contraindications. Yes? So if you have a client that has like an estrogen dominance uh -huh. uh, you know, their condition. Their condition, you would stay away from DHA, but what about pregnant women? Do you still use it? 
Um, it depends on the, scenario, the situation. So yeah, I would never say never as a general rule, but I would much more likely use pregnenolone if I had any doubt at all, if I had strong doubts, and quite honestly, if the patient made me nervous, you know, just made me nervous, I'm not gonna use it. Well, and uh, theoretically, as you repair digestion yeah. and the gut health, some of those levels should start to regulate on their yes. own. Yes, any good repair so should. Why would I wait for that? Right, yeah, exactly, so prioritization, thank you. What, these, what we're talking about here, these are nutritional considerations. We're not throwing everyone necessarily on all of these, but we want to consider these because they're in the ballpark of what we might want to consider. And yes, some of these patients could take years to fix their hormone levels. And, and others, you know, they, they fix right away, right? And if the levels are normal and they're not feeling, let's say, energetic, and they're not getting the muscle tone and the, and, uh, the reaction time they want and the memory back and the, the healing is slow, then I'm going to give them these hormones even if the levels get elevated. And it's the DHA sulfate, which is the better test rather than just the DHEA. You want the sulfated form in your testing or, you know, bypass the testing. Okay, uh, was there another question? Yes. So if DHT is too high yeah. or if, the, uh, if there's estrogen dominance, you go with pregnenolone versus DHT? Yes, right. And again, the s simple reason is when you look at a hormone chart, which we will have one, it's just higher up, and that dose will trickle and divide itself and be diluted, in a sense. Okay? Yeah? Um, we have the DHEA uh, pump, which mm -hmm. is five. Um, five milligrams? Yeah, so is that, I mean, I know it's, it's stronger, so it's kind mm -hmm. of more absorbed. You can certainly start with five, okay. and of course you're putting that under the tongue, so you're gonna get more immediate release. It's gonna bypass the hepatic you know, pathways there, and then you can start with five. But the thing with the pumps is you should use them. Uh, and maybe even to start, that's actually a very good idea. Uh, just realize that the pumps aren't the same every time. So you might get three, you might get five, you might get six milligrams. It's gonna be a little bit all over. But at the low doses, it shouldn't matter. Just, just a side note. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. It's also very good uh, with skin lesions, um, wrinkles, age spots, the DHA uh, pumps. Okay. All right, so we got this. We've done. Okay. Okay. Yes. When you're talking about DHA spots, you're talking about putting the DHA right on. Uh huh. The yeah. Yep. Wrinkles, all good stuff. Yes. Do you take too much of prey legal out? Whatever. I don't take too much. Do you? No, I'm okay. just saying. Okay. Can you, can you take too much? Would it, uh, you know, offset, offset stuff? Offset stuff. Yes. You can take too much. And we're going to talk more about pregnenolone uh, in this cycle. You can take too much and you can take not enough. So this was just a, a study on the uh, Cree uh, Celazine product, where it, which is in the X-Flame uh, product uh, for Nutritional Frontiers. Swelling, immune modulation, mobility improvement, anticoagulation, DNA repair. When you say DNA repair, you're talking like cancerous stuff and cellular repair. It's a big deal. And again, all these, in, then in a, from an anticoagulation perspective, all these autoimmune conditions have coagulation problems every single one. They're either clinical, meaning you can measure them as like an elevation in some of the clotting factors, protein C, protein S, all these different things. Um, but sometimes they're just evident as like under a microscope, you see red blood cells clotting and you see a low platelet count on a blood test. But when you look under a microscope, the platelets look like grapes. They're just stuck together and the count is really fine. They're just stuck together and the machine counts this big grape as one. Get it? That's why I do microscopic work, because I can see the structural issues and some functional issues. Like you can look at white blood cell mobility. So when I set up some of the people I work with with uh, um, microscopy, and you set that up to a TV and you show that to people, they're not going anywhere. They see that stuff, they're blown away. And then all the nutrition, how it makes all the changes, then you'll see bugs in there and you'll see the Lyme disease everyone's looking for, you see the spirochete, you know, and then you kill it, you know. So put some of that micro gun on the scope and everything goes pretty good. So this study just showed it's just good for a lot of the common symptoms among a lot of autoimmune diseases, which are joint fatigue, immune mobility, coagulation is my point. We're going to skip that one. And uh, you know how like some speakers, they, you, get, you get handouts and then they like, change them up on you and you just that's so annoying. Well, I did that, sorry. Uh, I couldn't help it. I was working on this this morning. 
So, and um, the Paracleanse, again, this is a, a product which has a wonderful combination, as I mentioned earlier, of anti-infectious um, herbs, uh, detoxifying herbs, anti-inflammatory herbs, liver protective herbs, all good stuff. Start with the dose on the bottle and increase until um, you feel you've got the right dose. I like to dose people, not just with this, but with most nutrients, with exceptions, but most nutrients three times a day, if possible. That's very hard for most people to do, I get it. But in the autoimmune universe, sometimes you just have to. You know, the half-life of these nutrients are what they are. So um, if you can't do it, see, when I meet a patient the first few times, and they're starting to get into things, and they're making mistakes, right? And they're already talking about what failures they are, and then you're like, oh boy, they're out of here in like three minutes. So what, what can I do to help them? Is I let them know that this is completely normal. Uh, no one will be able to comply 100% to these suggestions. These are difficult. You're doing fine. But I'm glad that you told me, um, because when you come up with issues, we want to look at what you've done and re- um, configure the suggestions to fit what you can reliably do. So if you're telling me you can only take your nutrients in the morning, that's just what's happening, then I'm going to make sure to balance them out as well as I can to get the maximum effect one time, one time a day. Most people understand that. A few people look up to the ceiling because they don't. And then I tell them, well, it's kind of like exercise. So if I, like I have an exercise yesterday because I was traveling, and here I am, and I didn't last night, and after this I'm, I'm home. So when I, tonight, I'm going to do the whole body. Is it as good as me breaking it up in three parts you know, every other day? No. But it's pretty darn good. So I use that analogy, an analogy that the patient can understand. And um, be careful with analogies, though, because they'll take your analogy and they'll go, they'll go out the window with it. So try to relate to, if they're engineers, use engineering terms. You know? And then they start listening. They're like, what? Oh, yeah, right, right. We don't expect to build everything in a day. Oh, I get it. OK, so you know, something like that. OK? Questions, concerns, input? All right. Oh, every herb in that paracleanse has been shown in evidence-based studies between a moderate and strong evidence base to actually kill viruses, parasites, fungi, and bacteria for real. So it can be used topically. It can be used, uh, obviously, internally. Okay. This is a journal of immunology right here. Let's just change my place here on the room. And this particular journal here said that, you know, in humans, there's a complex, complex interaction between the host immune system and the microbiome in the gut. And it goes on to say on the third bump right here, the third point, this uh, mutualistic relationship is compromised and, and there's an altered interaction between immune cells and microorganisms. The gut microbiota may cause or contribute to the establishment of infectious disease and trigger autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases can be triggered from the gut. They can be caused from the gut. You know another place they can be caused by? There's a lot of places, but I'm looking for one. The mouth. So my radio show yesterday was uh, all about how infections in the mouth, or just bacteria in the mouth, of people that just think they're fine, are related to a variety of cancers. This is all medically proven stuff. Arthritis, um, heart disease, diabetes, and autoimmune diseases. This is old news, actually. I always say that when this comes up because when I, this had to be 20 years ago, I was coming home from the city. I used to work in New York City. I was at Grand Central Station. I had to wait for my train. I needed something to read, so I pick up the Scientific American magazine, which you know is sort of like a, the biggest science thing for the average person. And I'm, I sat down, and the, the thing right on the front cover is how oral bacteria cause all these diseases. You know, and what those journals do is they just summarize what the medical journals do in layperson terms, but super smart layperson terms. So Scientific American is a, is a very complicated journal, you know? So um, I did the show on, uh, on the oral health, you know, connection between disease, but the leaky mouth is the same as a leaky gut. So when you floss and you brush your teeth, you're pushing these bacteria and viruses and other organisms, fungal organisms, in your circulation. And forever, they've known in cardiology and dentistry that that certainly causes endocarditis. Um, and they thought for a long time that that might even cause 
um, infectious lesions um, in people with um, certain valvular problems, like, like, tri like tricuspid valve problems. Or, I'm sorry, mitral valve problems. So they would prophylactively, dentists would give their patients antibiotics, except something like, I'm guessing five years ago, they said, sorry, we were wrong. That doesn't reduce risks of that, nothing, except add to the antibiotic resistance problem that will basically kill us all eventually. <laughs> okay. um, the number one cause of disease now pretty much is infectious disease. And we're walking around with stuff in the mouths. So this is talking about the gut, that's true, but it can trigger it here, everywhere, cascade of events, here, cascade of events. Okay. So the microgon uh, liquid product can be used as a mouthwash. Do we have any of that here? In the back, I'm sure, right? When someone gets a chance, I would just love to take a look at that bottle for a minute. So, um, so I got this idea. This is such a big deal that um, I did the show and I talked about this product and I looked up every herb in it. And I'm telling you, there isn't a bug. Even Ebola and HIV are killed with some of these herbs in a Petri dish. Thank you. Oh, okay. Can I keep this thing? I love this stuff. So I just relabeled this natural mouthwash. And uh, so I put every patient on this, every one. Who could not use this as a mouthwash? We call that an off-label use, I guess. So they want to rinse with two droppers of this two to three times a day. Once in the middle of the day, in the morning, and at, and at night. They first want to get up, rinse their mouth out with water, rinse it with this, then they can floss and brush. I personally floss first and then brush. Some people brush first and then floss. I'm like, then, then what's your mouth smell like? You know. So anyway, then use this. This will be absorbed. It'll help improve oral health. It'll help repair tissues. It makes the mouth less leaky. It kills the bugs on contact. It doesn't cause, thank you, it does not cause uh, mutated resistance bugs like antibiotics do. And that was amazing to me when I read that in the literature. None of these herbs do that. Yes? Do you have to have it in there a certain amount of time before you brush yeah. it away? Yeah, 30 seconds to a minute oh. is what I advise. Um, that will, it covers the time that they had this in contact with these infectious agents in the Petri dish. And guess what? The mouth is a Petri dish. I mean, it couldn't be any better of a direct study. We're not, we're not saying some other animal in some other way. Direct contact. So um, that's my original idea. I've only had one in my life, and that was it. Everything else I've stolen from someone else. So um, again, water first, simply because I made this up. Just getting a lot of stuff out. Just gets a lot of stuff out. Then use this to clean it up. You don't want to use brushing or flossing until you kill the stuff. Otherwise, you risk pushing it in, right? That's my, my common sense on that one. So now, since everyone needs to do this, this is something people will be using from me their whole life. That's pretty good. And they should, and I've done a good thing. Yes? We're not worried about enamel issues? Nope, this will not hurt enamel. Uh, however, the one contraindication might be if someone has an alcoholic history, because we do have some alcohol in here. Excuse me. Oops, sorry. All right. <laughs> Just a little. Okay, um, more about that. We don't have to go through all of this. Okay, am I going the wrong way? Um, okay, um, these slides just emphasize, so for example, black walnut, so there is cumulative resistance against antibiotics of, of many bacteria, we know this. Synergistic combinations of antimicrobial agents with different mechanisms of action have been introduced as more successful strategies to combat very drug-resistant infections such as MRSA and also um, uh, Clostridium difficile. And um, okay, in this study, they investigated synergistic antimicrobial activity of a variety of herbs which you find in paracleans. <coughs> and they work synergistically and kill off fungal organisms in the mouth. If, if someone with diabetes or someone with any of these autoimmune diseases has candida in the mouth, and it may not be visible, Excuse me. Those organisms will see the body. They'll continue to see the body. You have to work on the mouth like you have to work on the gut. <coughs> so
So they know in medicine that a combination, the brilliant idea is a combination of antibiotics will work better. Combination. The, yeah, okay, so let's use herbs in a combination. And guess what? It works too. It works too. And herbs don't interfere with antibiotics, just so you know. So if your patient's on those antibiotics, they're definitely going to be on those antibiotics, and you certainly don't want to tell them stop taking your antibiotics. You can synergistically push them to the next level of immune, actual repair of the immune system. There's no repair happening with antibiotics. I'm not saying they're never necessary, but there is no repair. There's only killing. And then there's survival of the fittest of these bugs, which are mutated and uh, in, a, in a bad way. But that doesn't happen with the herbs. Oh, I think um, we have maybe five minutes before break. OK, good. These are, again, just other examples. Oh, about 10 minutes? Great. Fantastic. OK, just more specifics about that. Um, I had mentioned Clostridium difficile. Uh, or just persistent infections, okay? Persistent infections. Like you have those patients with many UTIs, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I got another UTI. Well, I say, how do you know you don't, didn't just have a recurrence of your old infection? You've been on antibiotics and all antifungals. Why not? Why couldn't that have been? Of course it can be. Um, first of all, when you have a woman, mostly women, who have the UTIs and they're re re uh, recurrent, um, what is a very common cause of that? Just give me a couple causes. You can't be wrong. Tell me. So some immune dysfunction, diabetes. If someone keeps getting infection, you've got to think diabetes. And then if they're, if they're only pre-diabetic, they'll say, oh, no, my doctor said I'm just pre-diabetic. I'm on the borderline. I said, borderline, huh? I said, so is that like borderline heart attack? Borderline being pregnant? I'm not really sure what, where I should go with that one. <laughs> so um, the thing is that, it was a question. I might as well take it. What about sinus infection? Will that cause a UTI? Very interesting that you brought that up. There is evidence to support that infections in certain areas of the body can cause infections in other areas of the body. And that's because of a process known as translocation, which is a fancy term for I'm an infectious bug and I'm going to move around. Yes, translocation from the mouth in the blood. We've already discussed it. We just didn't use the term. Translocation in the gut to other places. Oh, absolutely. In medicine, they tend to, they tend to recognize basically one clear example of that. And that's when you have systemic infection, you're in a hospital setting, and you're, you know, you're dying. You know, or, or you're you know, at risk of that. So yes, translocation happens constantly. And all of these access points we need to manage. One, two, three, all those points. How are we doing? OK? OK. And this will probably end with, with this, and then we'll take it up after the break. So this is. Uh, a little map here, obviously, of adrenal and sex hormone uh, production. And what we see here is cholesterol at the top. I'm going to say a few interesting things about cholesterol. Number one, you need cholesterol for cell, me cell membranes. If you take cholesterol-lowering medications, you increase your risk of killing other people, killing yourself. Suicide, suicidal ideation increases with the lower cholesterol because the brain's mostly made of cholesterol. So that's bad. Plus, cholesterol is an antioxidant. Yep. So that's why people with cholesterol levels under 160 have much higher cancer risks so, and dementia risks. So I said a lot there, right, in like three sentences, because those are my three sentences I love saying. There's so much in that. So the liver makes all the cholesterol you need. So we want to support the liver in proper cholesterol production. But if cholesterol is too low for that person, then they may not, they will not make, they, I should say they may not make the downstream hormones. So cholesterol obviously makes pregnenolone, which you see then makes progesterone. So if someone takes too much pregnenolone, they can push too much DHEA production, too much androstenedione, too much testosterone, too much estrogen, right? It's right there. Now, you don't really know if that person is going to be producing the 17 beta estradiol or the estrone or estriol, because some are more pro-cancerous potentially, some are more anti-cancerous. You just don't know. There are tests to, to check on those things. Um, and then, of course, uh, pr pregnenolone forms progesterone. So women with hot flashes, you know, you give them DHEA and pregnenolone with some DIM, they're doing great. Those three things, they're doing great. And then if someone has weak adrenals, you, give, you can give them pregnenolone because pregnenolone increases cortisol because it helps to help recovery of the adrenal glands and the adrenal um, cortex, which is where cortisol is made. So that's a pretty interesting little chart there. 
you should just get an idea of things. So again, you might have people with a high cholesterol and they have low hormones because they're stuck up there. It's like a funnel. They get stuck up there with the high cholesterol because these enzymes aren't working well to make these other uh, fat-based or cholesterol-based uh, hormones. And of course, the body also makes vitamin D from cholesterol when sun hits the skin. Okay? So liver, liver, liver helps the adrenal glands. And then the adrenal glands help everything. They're the master st stress glands of the body. We'll end with this concept. The, we have two adrenal glands. Your, patient may, your patients may not know this. Your, your kidneys are the size of your fist. The adrenal glands are on the top. They're in the back. I had a patient that says, yeah, my kidney hurts. I'm like, what makes you say that? And, and they said, well, it hurts like this. They thought it was like a tire that went around their, their waist. I'm like, no. <laughs> like the, and you don't feel it. This is interesting. You think, you know, sometimes I, I listen to myself talking, like, I don't even understand what I'm talking about. So we have to take a step back sometimes with our patients. It's really interesting, some of the things you hear. Um, and why shouldn't they be thinking differently? I mean, we, we do exist in our, our own, you know, our own dimension out here. So final thoughts. The adrenal glands are our stress glands. Hans Selye in the 1950s, he was a scientist, a researcher who popularized the whole stress response, the alarm reaction, the, what's the second one, the adaptation reaction, and the exhaustion phase. And um, he also coined the term stress. It was, a, it was a term used in engineering in the 50s. So when doctors read stress in the journal, they were like, what is that, next page? So no one paid any attention to it. So vitamin C is mostly stored in the adrenal glands. So we need vitamin C for our adrenal glands. We want to make sure that our, we have proper pregnenolone to, to support our adrenal glands because, closing thought, in all of these autoimmune diseases, there is adrenal, some degree of adrenal fatigue. When you tell that to a patient, they might mention it to their primaries and say, oh yeah, I was told I have adrenal fatigue, and then the primaries go nuts, right? They go, oh my God, I've got to go to the endocrinologist, send you to the endocrinologist, endocrinologist says, don't you, don't. We did, the, everything's fine. We didn't mean that, right? So, you, has this ever happened to anyone, or is it just me? So, you know, you need to be, say, no, it's, so your doctor's going to say this, but I'm telling you this, and they're not wrong, but this is this. You have to set them up to succeed. If you don't let them know uh, what the other one's going to say, which might be contrary to you, you, you've lost them. But if you tell them first, they'll come back and say, yeah, yeah, they said exactly what you said they would say, and it was great, and I knew to say that, and it worked out. So we're going to take a break. Thank you very much. See you in a little bit. How long? How long are we taking a break for? About an hour. Okay.